Okay, so my name is Anna Gibbs. I'm the general manager of the Keller Williams Hudson Valley Group. And this morning, we're going to go through the six personal perspectives, which is a foundational course that um, is offered through Keller Williams. However, it has nothing to do with real estate and everything to do with how to achieve great results by focusing on six key perspectives, which really in, incorporate mindset and behaviors. We'll talk about that this morning uh, so that you can really achieve the results that you're looking to accomplish in your business and in your life. And um, Gary Keller, I believe wrote the course. It's something that we've offered at Keller Williams for a long time. Uh, and I'm excited to share it with you this morning because I think that these very simple and key perspectives are really the combination to open the lock to your success. So um, I'm excited that we can get into it this morning. And again, if you're here with me on Zoom, thank you for being here. Uh, I am streaming this live on Facebook as well. And um, so if you're here, we'd love to hear from you. If you have questions, please feel free to use the chat. Um, or, you know, you can raise your hand and come off mute. I'm going to um, definitely encourage your participation because I think it makes it a, a great experience. So we're going to get right in. So let's uh, start with the six personal perspectives. And I am going to share my screen. There we go. All right, everyone. So as I said, these are the foundational perspectives uh, that will help you achieve really, really big results in your life. So let's start with a question. And I'm going to ask for some of you to participate here as well. Um, tell me what is the, oops, what differentiates a high achiever from those who may not accomplish as much? So I'm going to give you a second to think about that question. What is it that differentiates those who achieve at the highest level from those who don't seem to accomplish as much? And I'm going to encourage someone to throw out a response. Who would like to share? I think they have a plan. So you believe what differentiates those who can achieve at a higher level from those who might not is that they have a plan. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, for sure. Thank you, Greg. Anyone else want to throw something out there? I Consistency. Too. Consistency. Awesome. Who else? Um, attitude. Attitude, for sure. Clarity. They know what they want and they focus. They know what they want and they focus. I would definitely agree with that. Thanks, Jen. <laughs> One or two more, anyone else? Motivation. They have a motivation to accomplish something, okay. Someone who sets goals. A goal setter, I like that. So I think that you're all right, for sure. Uh, and I think that the key here, uh, what a lot of these things can fall under is mindset, right? So they have this mindset and they have an approach to wanting to accomplish their goals. Um, and so they have a plan, they have the right attitude, uh, they have the right um, process in place, um, but you know, it's really about the mindset. So let's, let's look at mindset and how it works with our attitude and our approach to life. So when you think about mindset, it's about having a perspective, okay? And when we think about an attitude, it might be uh, the, the feelings and the beliefs that you have behind the mindset to move forward. And then your approach to life could be a lot about those two things as well as strategy. All of that coming together is kind of woven into what we're going to discuss this morning in the six personal perspectives. So what, what are the six personal perspectives? Well, here they are. The first step is to commit to self-mastery. And we're going to go through each one of these. So the first one is to commit to self-mastery. So when you think of mastering something, what comes to mind? Erin? Becoming an expert, knowing the most about it that you can. Yeah, becoming an expert, knowing the most about it. So when we talk about self-mastery, this is about understanding yourself at a really high level. Step two is committing to the 80-20 principle. 
I'm sure many of you have heard about the 80-20 principle before. Uh, some of you might know it as the Pareto principle. And so we'll, we'll dive into this too in a few minutes, but basically it's, it's knowing that there's this predictable imbalance to things in life, right? Where putting your time and energy into fewer things can actually bring you greater results, right? And so we'll look at that with our time. We'll look at that with some of our tasks and we'll break that apart in a minute. Step three, one of my favorite concepts to teach is moving from E to P, which is basically understanding that in order to, to break through to a higher level of performance and production, um, that breakthrough will only become possible when we start doing things that are more purposeful or less comfortable for us. And that is what's going to break us through to a higher level. Step four, we'll unpack the um, concept around being learning based and how that applies to your actions and your results. And then in step five, we're going to discuss removing those limiting beliefs, those beliefs, those thoughts that really hold us back and keep us from achieving um, greater results or, or really living a bigger life. And then step six, the secret sauce is accountability. And my goal for us today is to take a look at accountability in a new way uh, so that you can see how instrumental this is really in, in achieving results and in your success and how accountability is not punitive, but really very healthy. So, so those are the six personal perspectives that we're going to discuss today. And um, again, I invite you to take notes, ask questions. I want you to get as much out of this time together as possible. Um, so let's go back and talk a little bit more about mindset. I think that mindset is really, it holds the key to an individual's um, success, right? So if you're taking down notes, you may want to write that down. Um, and I think that mindset and attitude determines what we're willing to accomplish, what we're willing to accomplish. And so these six personal perspectives will help you achieve results at a really high level. And it's really about preparing first for your own mindset, because isn't it true? And, and for those of you that are at Keller Williams, we have so many resources available to us, right? We all have access and even outside of Keller Williams, I mean, the world is just a click away, really. You can find anything you want through some research online. And so we have access to, to great resources around business and personal development. We have access to speakers and trainers and coaches through podcasts and books and classes like this. And so if we have all these tools available to us and, and it's pretty equally available to everyone, why isn't everyone achieving success at a high level, right? Why are some people struggling and others not? Why are some people growing big businesses or uh, you know, accomplishing the things they set out to do like starting not-for-profits or writing a book or creating some type of new invention, whatever it is, right? Whatever you're, you're dreaming about. Why are some of us able to do that while others are struggling? I believe the key is in our own mindset. Right. So as we get into this conversation this morning, you know, you can understand these six principles at a high level. You might even start to implement some of them in your in your world, in your life. Yet, if your mindset brings you back into that box that keeps you, you know, safe within your comfort zone, then you're you may struggle to to really get to the next level. So that's why accountability and removing limiting beliefs is going to be a big part of our conversation today. So who's excited? I would like for you to put in the chat. Uh, an intention you have around this class. What is what is the reason why you're here? What would you like to get out of this? You know, what what caught your attention about this class? You know, what is your intention? What would you like to really take away from this morning together? So just put that right in the chat for me. Now, the other thing that I'd like for you to think about this morning, kind of around an intention, you know, is what is a goal that you have right now in your, in your life, in, in your professional uh, world, in your personal world? What is a goal that you really have an intention to accomplish this year? And as we're going through these perspectives, I want you to anchor some of this to that goal and give yourself an opportunity to see how these perspectives will help you accomplish your goal, okay? All right, awesome. So let's go, you ready? 
Who's ready? All right, let's get into it. So the first perspective we're going to talk about this morning is committing to self mastery. Committing to self mastery. Oh, these are just some notes around the perspectives that we talked about. Oh, by the way, let me just give you some housekeeping. So I have uh, taught this class many times and I've gotten pretty good at condensing the core principles of this course into about an hour and giving us a little time for Q&A. So you might see me scroll through a couple slides quickly, uh, but you're gonna get the essence of what we're here to talk about today. All right, so let's talk about self-mastery. This is all about you, mastering you. So self-mastery is the possession of great knowledge, skills, and habits that make you the master of you. So when you commit to achieving self-mastery, number one, you know your goals. And I'll go as far as to say you're setting goals in key areas of your life, right? You're, you're looking at your life. Um, I teach, as a coach, I teach the uh, Wheel of Life. Gary Keller and The One Thing uh, uses the circles. Uh, it's the same concept as the Wheel of Life. Basically, it's understanding that there are different areas of your life, right? Your career, your um, health and your wealth, your relationships, um, your spirituality. So it's giving you an opportunity to set goals in all areas of your life, right? So someone who is really, really on a path of self-mastery knows their goals and they know their goals in multiple areas. The second thing, they know their strengths and they know their weaknesses. Now, the opportunity here is for us to really understand our strengths at a high level and for us to leverage our strengths um, and for us to use that, excuse me, for us to use our strengths and really um, apply those strengths with our ability to achieve our goals. Now, our weaknesses, as a coach personally, I am not usually someone who is going to, to encourage you to overcome all your weaknesses. I think a lot of times our weaknesses are our weaknesses for a valid reason. However, how can we leverage our weaknesses? How can we get someone to help us? How can we implement systems, tools, technology, right? So that we can leverage and overcome some of those weaknesses. Uh, number three, when you commit to achieving self-mastery, you know how to work with both of those strengths and weaknesses to reach your goal. So I just wanna pause here for a second uh, and make sure that everyone knows there are great tools available to you if you're not really sure what your strengths and weaknesses are. There are assessment tools that you can take. Uh, and if any of you would like information about that, reach out to me. You can send me an email at annagibbs at kw.com. And I'll be happy to send you um, one of our assessment tools. We have a couple. Uh, at Keller Williams, we have a great tool called the KPA which will help you look at some uh, key parts of your behavior profile and how you think and communicate so that you can understand where those strengths and weaknesses lie. And then there's other tools too. Another assessment tool that I um, happen to think uh, is really also very powerful is the DISC. And the DISC profile will help you assess four key behavior areas, decision-making, your influence with people, uh, your level uh, or preferred level of stabilization or stability, and then the C is compliance, which is kind of like how you look at the world through a set of rules. And with assessments, there's never a right or wrong. It's just where you happen to fall on that spectrum. And it's a great way for you to understand more about why you do what you do uh, and how to use your strengths to achieve success at a high level. So if any of you would like more information about that, please let me know. I'm more than happy to send an assessment to you and even offer to validate it with you, uh, which is really the key too, because when you validate or have someone else validate it and, and get to really pull it apart and understand what it's saying and what it's not saying, that's really where the opportunity comes in to use a, at, at a higher level. So assessments are great ways for you to know your strengths and weaknesses. Okay, so as um, I heard, I think Aaron say something around um, mastery. Uh, here, here is another definition. Mastery is the possession of great knowledge, skills, and habits that make one the master of a subject. And this pathway to mastery is a journey. 
not an event. So I like to use the example of um, someone who is studying martial arts. So if you or someone you know has ever achieved a black belt in martial arts, um, they, they, they put a lot of time into that, am I right? This wasn't something that happened quickly. It wasn't something that happened overnight. So there was a lot of time. There was a lot of practice. There were different levels they had to go through to get to that black belt. And so um, the same thing is true of mastering anything. It's about putting the time in. Uh, the book that you see here, Outliers by Mal Malcolm Gladwell, uh, Malcolm discusses this in the book, and he says that in order to master anything, it takes a minimum of 10,000 hours, 10,000 hours. So when, when we take a look at some things that we know will help us achieve success at a high level in our business, right, for those of us in real estate or any kind of customer-driven business, um, let's talk about some things, right, like script practicing, Let's talk about, you know, the, the principle that we know lead generation has to show up in our day every day, right? Well, what are we doing to improve our skill set and become masters at any of those key skills? So if you've ever sat back and admired someone for their ability to communicate, or if you've ever watched someone in a sales presentation, uh, or, you know, um, maybe listening to someone deliver a class or a podcast or what have you. And if you've ever uh, really been um, influenced by it and impressed by their ability, make sure that you take a moment and acknowledge that that person probably didn't wake up one day and just have that ability naturally. I mean, some of us may have some natural ability that, that got us where we are, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Yet that person has put a lot of time and effort into crafting that skill, right? And so time on the task is what's going to make you a master as well. So if you're writing down some notes, and if you're looking to apply this in your world right now, I would say, go back to that goal I had you think about and ask yourself, what skill do you need to really master in order to achieve that goal? Is there something that you need to learn, something that you need to develop at a higher level that would make achieving that goal faster and easier, right? Or the another question would be, where can I apply a level of mastery? What is something that I wanna really become masterful at? And identify how you can put more time on that task, right? So I think that this, this opportunity for us to develop mastery uh, is, is a big part of what makes us who we are, right? As, as human beings, we have this great opportunity to develop skills and to become masterful. So what are those areas that you want to develop mastery around that will help you succeed at a higher level in your career, that will help you succeed at a higher level personally? Um, write it down so that you can create a game plan around that. I'm going to skip this video. Okay, I'm going to ask real quick, any, any questions around self-mastery, any ahas? Um, I'm not sure what's happening with my screen. It's live TV, guys. Let me stop sharing. Any questions around self-mastery for anyone in the group? Any ahas? Deb, do you have something you want to say? I saw you come off mute. I'm just going to pick on you. No, I, I just love the uh, 10,000 hours and in, in, in that book, um, he talks about the Beatles, you know, and how their early days, they spent all this time in Germany, you know, just as these young boys, and that was really a game changer for them. And I just love the stories like that, that just help you to just like, see that it, you know, it does take that repetition that, you know, patience with yourself and that determination to, to, to get to the other side. So yeah. I, I just wanted to share that beetle preference. <laughs> I love that. Thank you. Awesome. All right. Anyone else have any ahas around developing self-mastery? Okay. Let's go into the second perspective, which is committing to the 80-20 principle. So show, show me some hands. Who's heard of this before? 
who feels they could explain this really well or in, in a simple way? I'd love to hear what your explanation is. All right, Erin, go for it. So 20% of your activities give you 80% of your results. Absolutely, it's acknowledging that only 20% of your activities will bring 80% of your results, absolutely. Anyone else wanna take a stab at it? Okay, let me give you a very simple definition of the 80-20 principle, write this down. More results, fewer activities. More results with fewer activities. And I get it, this seems very counterintuitive to a lot of us, right? Because um, again, we all have a different behavior profile. There are some of you who like to check off the boxes and feel like you're getting a lot of things done in a day. Uh, there are some of us who are just programmed to, to think that success comes by working really hard and putting in long hours and doing a lot of things. Uh, yet the truth is for us to achieve success at a high level or and for us to really be high achievers, high performance professionals, the truth is that you will accomplish more by doing less. Now, that means fewer activities bring greater results. It, the key though is knowing what those activities need to be. It's not just saying, I'm gonna work less and I'm gonna do less things in a day. It's understanding what key activities will bring those results. So, Again, the 80-20 principle is often referred to as the Pareto principle. Pareto was an Italian economist um, who really uh, coined this phrase and did some research on this. Um, and so there's a lot of information available to us about the 80-20 principle. Um, but basically, again, it's the idea that 20% of your activities will bring 80% of your results. So when you think about the activities that you could be focused on in a day, what's in your 20%? That is the catchphrase we use a lot in our world uh, at Keller Williams and in the market centers, right? What's in your 20%? Those are the big rocks. Those are the key things that when we put them first and make them a priority, a lot of times everything else becomes unimportant or not as essential. And uh, again, uh, I'll share another resource with you. Gary Keller wrote the book, The One Thing. He talks a lot about this in The One Thing. Um, also, um, the opportunity uh, for us to look at you know, our day as a whole and our activities as a whole and identify which of those things become the priority uh, is really an important concept for us in terms of achieving success at a high level. So in this concept of the 80-20 principle, it's also knowing that there's this pattern of imbalance and that that's predictable. So in other words, in achieving your goals, in pursuing your goals, it's knowing that everything is not necessarily going to be equal in your calendar, within your time limits, within your efforts. Sometimes we're gonna have to make a choice and we're gonna have to know clearly how to identify priority. And the only way you'll really know what is a priority is knowing your goals. See, I find that most people who don't have clear goals, they flounder. And they're the ones who struggle a lot with this concept, right? Or they have goals and they're not identifying with the goal, right? So when you have a goal, now you can develop that GPS. And so as you start to make choices about how to use your time, you decide, is this activity really going to bring me the greatest amount of results as it would relate to achieving my goal, right? Because some things are going to be important and some things are going to be urgent. Some things are going to be good things to put your time into and some things are going to be great things to put your time into. And that's the discernment is knowing what you need to put your energy into because when we spend our time uh, really doing a lot of things, there's this law of diminishing return we don't always get back what we put in. 
And I think that for us to realize that it might just be one or two things, you know, or one or two, you know, areas of our business that we focus on every day, that is really going to be the difference of pushing us through the next level. So in our, in our business, right, it would be lead generation. If you're making that your priority every day, and this is true for everyone who's in this class right now, everyone who's on this call. So if, if you, um, if you work with customers, you're lead generating for, for more customers, right? If you are in a service type business, like the staff in our Keller Williams Market Centers, their clients are our agents, right? Team leaders, your clients are agents, right? So whoever it is, if, if you're there to grow your business by servicing other people, then your lead generation has to become a priority. That has to be one of your big rocks. And Stephen Covey, I'll give you another resource. Stephen Covey, uh, you can find um, a video or two on YouTube uh, where Stephen Covey talks about this and basically uh, uses the example of a jar of rocks and has someone come up. And if you can picture three different jars, there's, there's big rocks, there's small pebbles, there's even some gravel. He uses the analogy um, that, you know, all of these rocks represent different activities you can spend your time on. They label the priorities in that person's life as the big rocks. And then he asks that person to, to, to get it all to fit into one jar, right? Which represents, let's say your day or, or whatever time period we're looking at. And so instinctively, this person starts pouring in the gravel and the small pieces first and filling up the jar, right? Because that's what we're programmed to do. We wanna fill it up. And then they're trying to fit the big rocks on top and it doesn't work. And so when he asks this person to start all over again by putting the big rocks in first, miraculously everything fits. So that is a really powerful uh, metaphor and analogy for our world, our lives, our, our time. Are you putting the big rocks in first? Because what happens when you don't? What happens when you don't put those first? Do we get to them? Not usually, right? Because we're checking off the boxes and getting a lot of things done. So. If again, you're, you're, you wanna take um, the most you can out of this class this morning, make a note, what are my big rocks? Ask yourself to you know, identify what are your big rocks? So put it in the chat right now. Put, let me know what some of your big rocks are. Now I'm gonna spend a few more minutes on this concept. There's a lot to talk about here. Um, so, the other thing, I mentioned something called the law of diminished returns. So I want to talk a little bit about energy as it relates to your time and how you are working to accomplish your goals. When you stay focused on the 80% stuff, it takes a lot of energy. And energy cannot be created nor destroyed. It can only be transferred, by the way. So as you're depleting all this energy by staying stuck in your 80% stuff, that's one of the reasons why you don't get to the 20% activities because you're just, your battery is, is, is dead, right? So we, we focus our, our efforts on the 20% because we want to put our energy there. And when we understand that those 20% activities bring 80% of our results, this, my friends, is the definition of working smarter rather than harder. So when you've heard that phrase before, here it is. This is working smarter rather than harder. And it lines up with us getting what we really want, right? Because the key is not to be busy, the key is to be productive, right? So when you're busy, you're, you're moving, you're doing a lot of things, but when you're productive, you're getting results. When you're productive, you are getting results. When you master this 80-20 principle, you're living life at a really high level. It's not just career goals. Like you're living life at a high level because you're making decisions about what works for you and what doesn't work for you. You're making decisions based on your own sense of goals and accomplishments and what is important for you in your world. You're, you're preserving your energy for the most important things. You're saying no to things that don't serve you and saying yes to things that grow you. 
when you've mastered the 80-20 principle. I'm gonna say that one more time. Somebody, I just feel like somebody needs to hear it again. Say no to the things that don't serve you and say yes to the things that will grow you. And the things that will grow you are not always easy. I didn't say they would be easy. They can be challenging and they will grow you. So again, the, the identifying your 20%, it's a narrow focus. It's a narrow focus. And again, I know for some of us, this is counterintuitive. Um, Gary talks about this in the one thing too. When you bring your focus very small, you actually can achieve much bigger results. When you bring your focus very small, you will achieve much bigger results. So those top producers who are just focused on lead generation all the time, big results, right? They're not getting distracted by the 80% stuff. Um, so just real quick, I'm gonna go through a couple other things. So I love that Gary talks about this in the one thing, uh, make a success list, not a to-do list. So again, a lot of us are programmed to have these long lists of things to do, right? This laundry list of stuff, and um, it's not gonna serve you because it's, there, it's not clear where your priorities need to be, right? So I will sometimes suggest to people that I'm coaching and consulting that they need to do a mind dump, right? So you may need to get stuff out of your head and onto paper, but realize that's just step one. That's not your to-do list. Now what you have to do is take a look at all this stuff that you just put on paper and identify your two, maybe three rocks, those big rocks, and what is in your 20% as it lines up to your goals. And now you're gonna make a success list, right? The things that you will do and accomplish to get results, right? Which is the definition of productivity so that it moves you closer to your goal. Make sense? So in doing that, again, another thing that we have to embrace is our calendar. We need, we need to schedule the time to be able to do the things that we say are the big rocks. Because if it's not on your calendar, it does not exist. If it is not on your calendar, it does not exist. So then time blocking the right amount of time for these activities uh, is going to become the, the next step. Now, I just wanna say something quickly on time management. Write this down. It is not time that you need to manage. It is your behavior. It is not time that you need to manage, it is your behavior. We all have 24 hours in a day. No one gets more time than anybody else. I know it might feel like it, but it's not true. It's just that we get to decide how we spend our time, right? So if you wanna stay in the office for 12 or 13 or 14 hours a day or whatever crazy amount of time that could be, uh, then that's your choice, right? So if you're looking at someone who is you know, running a marathon and enjoying time with their family or doing things, you know, civically and socially, and you're in the office all the time, they don't have more time than you. They just made different decisions on how to use their time. If you stay focused on your 20%, you can, you can get out of the office much sooner, right? Or end your workday sooner. So time management is not about managing your time. It's about managing your behavior. It's, it's managing the choices you make about how you use your time. Now, I get it. It may seem simple as we discuss it here today. It just may not always be easy to apply. And that's why it's important that you look for support around you. Um, you know, who in your market center can help you with this, right? Is it a conversation with a coach? Is it a conversation with a team leader? Um, if, if you're not in Keller Williams, you can certainly reach out to me. I'm happy to have these conversations with you. Who can help you understand how to set up and manage your time? or your behavior really, I should say, manage your behavior as it, it comes to using time. So that you can really start to move through to the next level of performance, right? Because a lot of times this, this is what keeps us stuck. So who can relate to this or you're all experts in this area and I'm just preaching to the choir. Who has some feedback or ahas around the 80-20 principle to share? 
Anybody? Hi, Deb. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think it's it, it's um, you know when you prioritize it and put it on your calendar and and have that reminder that every day this this these are my big rocks, you know, and and just it's so easy to get pulled to other things, but by staring at that every day and saying, okay, well this this is a priority and it has to happen, you know. So mm -hmm. if that person needs to wait an hour, they need to wait an hour and set level expectations for those around you so that that you can dive in and do the things that you know are going to get you where you want to go. Very, very true. Very true. And I, I see we have some people on Facebook too. Uh, I, I'm, hi guys, I'm glad that you're here and thank you for sharing. Keep putting your comments there. I am trying to keep up with you there too. You know, I, I think another thing I want to talk about quickly is what you see here on the screen, focus with the 411. And so if this is a new idea for you, uh, certainly reach out. Again, my email is annagibbs at kw.com. People in your market center can help you with this as well. Um, and so this is what we call a focus tool. And if you go to the one thing.com, you'll find information about the 411 and you'll be able to actually download the form. And what this helps you do is really, I say, focus on the 20% on the big rocks. So um, I don't know if there's probably an example in here. Yeah. So this is what a 411 form looks like. At the top, you're going to put down your, your annual goals, like three, four at most. And this particular form breaks down into different categories, like we talked about a few minutes ago, of these different areas of your life. So you can set uh, a goals around your business, your, your, your job. So let me just explain this. They have job and business separate, right? So... I'll use being a realtor as an example. There are activities that you focus on that is the job of being a real estate agent, right? But then there are other activities you want to focus on that is about running the business of having a real estate business. So that's the, the differentials right there. Uh, and then this also has a column for personal, financial, you know, personal health, whatever you want to really focus on. And so after you write down your annual goals, then each month you're going to take out a new sheet or start a new form if you do this online. And you're going to list out what are the monthly goals that you need to accomplish this month so that you stay on track for those annual goals. Some things maybe you divide by 12, other things maybe not so much because you know seasonality and other issues might come into play uh, and you're your time to, to accomplish certain things may change month to month, but it's just taking a real perspective on what I need to do this month so that it lines up with getting me to my goals. And then you focus each week. And the key here is to do this one week at a time. You're not gonna fill out your goals for all four weeks in one shot. You're going to do this each week. Um, and what I always share with people is the top, the annual goals, the monthly goals, those are the results that you want to achieve, right? In the weekly goals, that's really more of the activities. So I want you to think of the weekly section as your actions. What will you do this week that, again, puts you on track that will get the results that lead to the monthly goal and then the yearly goals? Right. So when you get to the end of the week and you assess your accomplishments, then you set the goals for the second week. And then you would set the goals for the third week at the end of the second week and so on. So a uh, couple things about this 411 in order for this to work. Number one, you have to be committed to it. You have to do it. So it's going to take some time for you to establish a new habit around using this form. Number two it is important that it lines up with your goals. So therefore you need to be clear about what your goals are. And then number three, after you, you create the 401, it needs to stay in front of you. Like it can't be something that you just put away somewhere and never look at. It has to be something that you visit every morning. And you have to see that your calendar reflects the, the items on this 411. So in other words, if I look at your calendar, and then I look at your 411, do I see that you block time for the activities that show up on your 411? Otherwise, this just becomes a wish list and not an action plan. Does that make sense to you guys? Tell me yes or no, yeah? So the other thing that makes this highly effective is sharing the 411 with someone else. And we're gonna unpack accountability in a few minutes, but 
you know, being able to discuss it with someone who can help you stay on track and help you, you know, really identify those areas that should be on your 401, maybe even sometimes gently help you reorganize it a little bit because it, it doesn't quite have the clarity that it could have, right? So who's used a 411? And again, I appreciate your feedback so that I'm not just listening to myself on this class. Um, who's used a 411 and what has that done, you know, to improve your productivity or how has it, you know, changed you? Aaron. Well, once I started using the 411 in conjunction with my calendar, like you just said, it made a huge difference. So in the beginning, I was just doing the 411 and then kind of going about my day and I wasn't matching them up. And once I started matching them up and making sure that I actually had the time block for the activities, I found I did the activities more consecutively. The other thing is giving myself permission to be a little selfish and time block the time to do those things and not let other people interfere. Yeah, and you know, I'm just, I'm not gonna dig in too deep, but you know what? It's not selfish. Mm -hmm. No, it's about self-preservation sometimes, right? Self-mastery too. I love that. Thank you, Erin. Hi, Delise, I see every hand raised. Hello. Yes, um, I definitely um, agree. I actually just started using the 411 effectively. Good. I think I, I had the tool, but I wasn't using it to the capacity that it should have been. Um, but I definitely, um, it, it, it definitely helps me see my 80% <laughs> results because I'm able to know where I'm supposed to be, how I'm supposed to get there. And I, I use each week to kind of map out my monthly goals because if I'm staying on top of my weeks, then I can stay on top of my month. Yeah, that's right. And then I use it basically, like you said, as myself, as the job, but then the business as my team and as how I want it to grow off of each other. So one of them, one goal feeds into the other. Love that. And it's a little bit awkward at first, right? When you start using the 411, sometimes it takes a couple of weeks to figure it out, right? It's like a work in progress. Um, but, you know, what I loved, you know, what you said about, you know, how to, how to just stay on track because isn't it true? Like we know our goals and yet we can suddenly arrive at June or July and be like, oh my gosh, half the year is gone. Right. And then all of a sudden it's the fourth quarter and it's like, oh, I got to play catch up. I'm not really where I need to be in terms of tracking for my goals. And so the 411 is an opportunity to, to mitigate that sooner, right. To stop that, that bleeding sooner and to get on track. So I love that you said that, Elise. Thank you for sharing. I can't see everyone, Erin. Is there anyone else with a, a hand up or, okay. All right. Awesome. So let's go on. Um, you can find this tool if you're with Keller Williams on mykw.kw.com. That's how I do my 411. I go into the website and do it online and I save it as a PDF. And I do, I do share my 401 every week with my business partner and with my, my coach. I have a coach that, that I give, that I send it to every week. So to wrap things up here, I think it's true. We sometimes can fool ourselves in believing there's never enough time to do it all. There's never enough time to be successful, but there is when you time block for it. I learned a long time ago, the more time blocked I am, the more freedom I create for myself. The more time blocked I am, the more freedom I create for myself. And, and I'll tell you why, because when I got really serious about time blocking, especially for my, my schedule for my career, I gave myself so much more free time personally. I could unplug and do what I wanted to on the entire weekend because I got it all done during the week. So I started living life in a bigger way. So I think this is true. There, there is uh, enough time to do anything you want. You just have to time block for it, right? And the key with time blocking too is making sure that you're taking enough time and not too much time, right? Because you wanna be able to, to, to be laser focused. So four keys to successful time blocking. If you want to take a picture of this or jot this down quickly. Number one, be consistent right? So that you can set the habit. It takes 66 days to build a habit. So you want to be consistent about this. Number two, be really thoughtful and purposeful about what shows up on your calendar. Number three, always time block those big rocks first. And number four, if you erase, you must replace. 
I think this is one of the first things I ever learned in business and time, you know, with time blocking. And yet this is one that really trips up a lot of people. If something shows up in your world and you decide that that becomes a new priority and it must replace something on your calendar, go ahead and do it. But whatever was there first was there for a reason. So where is it getting rebooked, right? So for instance, if you're gonna decide that you're gonna cut out an hour of your lead generation time because this appointment is that important, fine. But where is that hour of lead generation time going back on your calendar? because that commitment has to stay. So if you erase, you must replace. Any final thoughts or ahas around the 80-20 principle? Okay, let's go on to number three. And I, I recognize uh, for a lot of you, this may be a new concept. So um, we're gonna talk about moving from E to P. And it's, um, it's a pretty easy explanation. I'm gonna just find my one diagram here. Nope, they don't have it in here, okay. Um, I don't wanna watch the video, sorry. We just don't have time for that today, but I'm gonna help you understand E to P. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. So let's talk about your natural abilities. Let's talk about you being very entrepreneurial, right? That's what got you here. So if I was to ask you guys on Facebook, use the chat for all of you here on, on Zoom, you can come off mute. Tell me something about yourself that made it a natural um, opportunity for you in real estate. Like what is it about you or your natural skills that make you a good fit for real estate? Somebody throw something at me. Being a people person. Sure, being a people person. What else? If you're on Facebook, put it in the comments. I'll see it. What What else brought you into real estate? What made you a good fit for this? We have a lot of quiet people today. All right, so being a people person. Maybe being someone who uh, respects freedom and independence, right? You're a big thinker, you're a go-getter, you're a driver. Um, you, there's an element of building a business that attracts you. Um, you know, all the things that make you entrepreneurial, you're cut from a different cloth than a lot of people. Am I right? True? So when we think about all those things that brought you here to real estate, all those natural abilities, um, they will they will serve you. They will help you to continue to grow your business, right? Until it doesn't. Because at some point, your natural ability can only get you so far. Thank you, Diane. I see she was a sales executive in the fashion industry. So that kind of transferred over. Absolutely, right? You have transferable skills, totally. And so uh, like uh, using Diana too as an example, right? She has all this past experience in sales. Now she's applying it to real estate, transferable and, and something that makes her a natural fit. And yet that natural ability will only take us so far until it doesn't. And we hit what we call a ceiling of achievement, right? And for a lot of us, we know when we hit it. We know when we plateau in our business, we feel it, we can, we can feel the bump on our head. Uh, and so that, that ceiling and that, that limit, you know, when, when we get there, it's frustrating, right? And so when we feel frustrated, we might even feel confused, disenchanted. And for some of us, we may even start to see a decline in our productivity. Am I relating to you guys? Anyone experience this in their life? Could be in your business, could be anywhere. It could be on a diet, right? We, you get it? So we, we hit the ceiling, we get frustrated, we get disenchanted, and so we, we kind of slide back down. But again, we're entrepreneurial, we're driven, we have you know, different skill sets, we have different perspectives on life. So we, we get motivated, we grab ourselves by the bootstraps, we pick ourselves up and we start charging through and we start growing our business again, right? And we see production increase until it's not enough and we hit another ceiling of achievement. So this yo-yo effect can show up over and over and over again in your career, in your pursuit of your goals. I mean, whatever the goal is, whatever area of your life, you could, you could relate to this, this pattern, right? 
Well, what will break the pattern? We need a breakthrough. We need a breakthrough to break the pattern. And so what that is, is becoming more purposeful. So there is the E to P model. Um, and I do have a great diagram I can share with you guys on Facebook. I'll put it out there so you can see it later. So going from E to P is to acknowledge that doing things in a way that comes natural to you is not enough to achieve success at a really high level. In order to achieve success at a high level, to go for those bigger goals, to be a high performance professional, we need to apply a more purposeful way of doing things. So what are the more purposeful ways of doing things? Well, it would be implementing systems and models. Systems and models around your business plan, your uh, calendar and how you use your time. It would be uh, probably some, some lead generation systems and models uh, and anything that will help you be more productive. Another way for you to become more purposeful would be for you to grow in some sense, right? Personally or professionally. So it would be reading certain books, taking certain classes, hiring a coach, being accountable to someone. Some of the things we already talked about, right? Using a 411, uh, you know, really getting strategic with how you set your goals. All of, all of those things are more purposeful ways of doing things. Um, so it's, it's really about going from doing what comes very natural, very comfortable for you, to suddenly embracing things that may be uncomfortable. Because it's in that area of discomfort that we grow, okay? I'm sure you've heard the old saying, nothing grows in your comfort zone, and it's true. Your comfort zone is a very safe place. I, I, I like to think of it as a, as a baby's playpen, right? You put the baby in the playpen, you create this really nice environment for them. They're very safe. They can't get out. And that's really what we do to ourselves with our comfort zone. And I think a lot of times we want to convince ourselves that our comfort zone is a really happy place, that we're really good there. Um, yet, is it keeping us from living life in a bigger way? Is, is our comfort zone keeping us back from achieving much bigger goals in our business? And so when we're willing to do things that are uncomfortable, when we're willing to implement things that don't come so natural, like systems and models and coaching and reading things and going to classes and learning new things and being accountable, uh, is that the opportunity to see bigger results, right? So this is the E to P model. And I think that the key for us too is to understand how true this is in our lives. It's a, it's a truth. And for us to acknowledge that even once we make the breakthrough and we start to do things at a higher level of purpose, that we have to know what will come sooner or later from that. What will come is a new sense of comfort, is a new sense of mastery, Right. So what you have to acknowledge is that this E to P is going to repeat because what was once uncomfortable that you had to do in order to become more purposeful, time over task. We talked about developing mastery. Well, guess what? You're going to become very proficient in this new stuff and you're going to develop mastery on it. So you're going to get comfortable again. So in other words, what it takes to grow a business from zero to three million is not the same thing that it takes to grow a business from three million to 10 or from 10 to 30. And so we know that this E to P is going to repeat. And so when the ceiling shows up again, it's time to get uncomfortable and apply some purpose and get to the next level. So that is my explanation of the E to P model for you. Tell me your thoughts. Tell me what that means to you. Does that make sense? I really appreciate you guys. Uh, if you come off mute, tell me what you're thinking on Facebook. Um, who can relate to that? Who's having an aha? Anybody? You know, it's, I think it, it, this resonates a lot with me right now. You know, um, I always focused, I was the one I used to take the six personal perspectives. I've taken this class many times before and I always focused on 80, 20. And I realized now I think I'm in a position where E to P is really where I need to 
put my energy and trying to figure out where it is that I need to grow and what I need to do to break through that ceiling to the next level. Cause I do feel like I'm at that point right now where I'm hitting my head. Mm-hmm. So it really takes the time. It's taking the time to really sit down and do like a mind dump and figure out what is the area that I need to focus on specifically. What classes can I take? Books can I read to really learn something new to bring me to that next level? Beautiful. Yeah. There's a lot of opportunity there for sure. Um, and, and you know, when you're hitting your head on the ceiling, right? You feel it. And I love that you said that you've taken the class before, but wherever we are at any time in our lives is a new awareness. And it's always a new opportunity because we're never in the same place twice, right? So that's good. Anybody else before I go on to the next one? Hey, Delise. Hey, um, it's good that you said that because like I, I just like a lot of the classes are kind of on repeat in my life right now. Sure. But it's like like Aaron said, you know, it's it's always something different. And like it was the goal section, but like now I feel that I'm sort of at the ceiling. So it's like a re like reinventing myself. And I love the mind dump because you 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 get overcrowded. So I feel like some things just need to be put off. Like you, I've done that time to 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 take on something new and master that new thing and stop worrying about the old thing (laughs) love it yeah because we're always growing so you know and and it's an opportunity like again level up again and um the thing I like about mind dumping is I mean you know guys right your thoughts change every five seconds so if all that stuff is stuck up in here you're going to make all types of decisions around it. One minute, you're going to think that's your priority. In an hour, you're going to tell yourself it's something else. And it's not important. It is important. This, get it out of your head and put it on paper where it can live outside of your body and not play havoc with your emotions. And now you get to look at it and sort it out like laundry and figure out where it goes. So, so that's, that's why I love the mind dumping too. Awesome. All right. Thanks, guys. Let's go on to the next one. Uh, And I'm going to go back to the slide so that we can see that number four is make being learning based the foundation of your action plan. So look, I I think that in this group, especially because you're taking this class, you realize the value of being learning based. And at the end of the day, high achievers are learners. They're, They're readers. They are listening to podcasts. They're taking classes. And what I love is that you know, you can learn new things and you can get content in many ways. So if you're not a reader, listen to a podcast or, or download audible.com and listen to your book rather than read it. Um, and, you know, you can get some powerful content now, you know, a Facebook live in 10 minutes might give you an idea for something. And so what we're talking about here in terms of being an avid learner um, and, and being a sponge, being someone who's always looking to, to take on information, uh, but it's for the purpose of being action-based. So in other words, it's not just to sit and take classes and have bookshelves in your house and be able to show all the podcasts on your phone or whatever. It's that you are focused on listening to, following the influencers, reading the books, taking the classes that are relevant to you and your goals that are going to help you excel. Okay. So it's, so whatever classes you're taking, that's why whenever you take a class with me, I'm going to always say, write this down, write this down. What's your action step? What's your aha? What will you do next? Because there's no point in having really smart notebooks all over the place. If you can't use the information in your business to grow and to, to achieve results. So we're talking about in in the six personal perspectives, being focused on learning so that you can put it into action, okay? So a learning-based individual is an individual who has made the decision. So they're very purposeful and very, um, you know, decisive about using effective learning as the foundation piece for their action plan to develop their life. So in other words, the information that they're gaining it shows up in their strategy, write that down, that, you know, to be learning based and action oriented means that whatever I'm learning will show up in my strategic options. Okay. 
So at Keller Williams, there is a lot of resources. There are a lot of classes. There's a lot, like Elise just said, there's even stuff on repeat. You know, I get that, me too. Here's the, here's the, the, the truth though. High achievers will reach their goals by making training, education, and self-development the foundational piece of their action plans. In other words, a high achiever is not going to talk themselves out of taking a class or reading a book or listening to a podcast because it's not a good use of their time. They don't struggle with that. They put that in as part of their 20%. They schedule time on their calendar for classes and, and education because it's the, it's the information that they gain that they will be able to use in their actions that will help them achieve results at a higher level, right? They're sharpening their tools by plugging into being learning based never look at it as a waste of time. Unless you are not clear about your goals and you're not making good decisions about taking classes that line up with that, right? That's the key. So lots of things available to us at Keller Williams. If you have questions on that, ask one of your um, Market Center leadership uh, team members. Um, but, you know, again, Google's your best friend. If you want to know something, you can find it out there. These are just some of the books available here at KW. Uh, the MREA, the Millionaire Real Estate Agent book, is that foundational book that when we talk about the systems and models of Keller Williams, it's in this book. And honestly, if you took real estate out of that book, it is the blueprint for building any sustainable, profitable business. Um, and so whether you're in real estate or not, I think that the MREA book is, is a kind of like your curriculum for doing, for building your business. If you're interested in really building wealth and passive income, uh, then the MREI book is for you. It's right over here. I'm in the middle of reading it myself. Uh, and if you're interested in using real estate as your wealth builder, which would be smart, uh, then you might want to look at flip and or hold. Uh, and um, the other book that we talk a lot about in Keller Williams and in everyday conversations is shift. So in shift, Gary talks about 12 tactics to look at uh, internally and externally for really continuing to grow and manage your business in any market. And so that is, is also pretty relevant. So you can find these books on Amazon or you know, talk to any of us if you want to order them. And, and again, whether you're in KW or not, or real estate or not, I think these are, are books that you will find a lot of value. And um, practical, Gary, the way Gary writes, you can just take it and, and implement it. You've heard me refer to the one thing, um, and this is about achieving extraordinary results by narrowing your focus, right? Talks a lot about the 80-20 principle and some of the things that we've discussed here today. Um, and of course, we do have our uh, coaching division at Keller Williams known as KW Maps Coaching. And all of our education can be found on KW Connect. Uh, so again, if you are a Keller Williams agent, make sure that you're plugged into these resources. And um, know that your world changes as you take on this information. Okay, any questions or ahas around education and being learning based? All right, let's go into number five, the big one. Let's talk about removing your limiting beliefs. So high achievers, are just as human as everyone else. <laughs> High achievers will have a limiting thought, a negative thought, a doubt, a fear, but what really separates them from anyone else is the fact that they don't stay there, right? They know that by removing beliefs that hold them back, it will propel them forward. Simple, right? So how do we do that? And I'm sure that if we all were to take time right now to think about any time in our life when we've had a limiting belief, um, that we had an, op an option or an opportunity to change it, remove it or not. And I'm sure many of us have been successful in doing this before, right? Because that's part of evolution. That's part of growth, right? And, and that's another important thing that I want to just, just bring up today is that 
I don't think we acknowledge enough the work that we do to propel ourselves forward. See, we can spend a whole hour on just, you know, removing limiting beliefs. And I work with a lot of people in coaching to help them with just this. And it's interesting, some beliefs require that support, require that kind of help, like through coaching, but yet we've all been successful in removing limiting beliefs. I mean, think about a time when you had something that you held on to that really held you back, but you did something to change the way you thought and it moved you forward, right? So we've all had those successes. The key is continuing the process. So again, I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about, you know, removing limiting beliefs. Um, and so if you're writing down some notes, um, I'm going to, I'm going to ask you to take a space where you can just write some things down, you know, vertically. And the first thing I'm going to ask you to write down is the word belief. Belief. So your beliefs are the rules you live by. Your beliefs are the rules you live by, right? So if I believe that I am going to be lucky when I sit on the left side of the room, what do you think I'm gonna do every time I walk into a room? I'm gonna look for a seat on the left-hand side of the room because that's my belief, right? So your beliefs are the rules you live by. So what you believe to be true is how you start to behave. So our beliefs, they shape our thoughts, right? So when I walk into the room, what do I start thinking? Where is there a seat on the left-hand side of the room? Because my belief is I'm lucky when I sit on the left-hand side of the room. Okay, now my thoughts, they, they really shape our actions. So again, using my silly example, I walk into a room, I'm looking for that seat, that's what I'm thinking. And what do I do? I walk to the left-hand side of the room and sit down there, right? So my beliefs have shaped my thoughts, now it's shaped what I did. Your actions are bringing results. So some of the results I would get from that example is I only know what life looks like on the left-hand side of the room, right? So our results can be positive or negative. I don't know anybody on the right-hand side of the room. I never know what it feels like to sit over there. I don't know what the sun feels like from that window because I'm all the way over here, right? Again, silly example, but you get it. So your beliefs are the rules that you live by. Your beliefs shape your thoughts. Your thoughts shape the things that you do and the things that you say, and that's what's bringing results in your world. And those results, well, they're anchoring more beliefs and thoughts. So it's kind of programming again, right? So whatever you see, whatever is happening, if you determine that it's working, you're just gonna be on repeat. If you think it's not working, you're gonna change it up, right? So those, those results anchor and reprogram us, and that's what shapes our beliefs. So it's like this big circle. So all that being true, when your beliefs are positive, when your beliefs are powerful, when your beliefs are empowering your thoughts uh, and, and those thoughts become you know, really strong and powerful and, and allow you to do things in a big way, well, then that shapes everything you're doing and saying so you get extraordinary results and life is good. Yet what happens when your beliefs start to create negative thoughts, right? Like maybe you believe that you can't be a $25 million producer because of something that you're holding on to, maybe even from when you were a kid. And so that belief shows up in your thoughts, like, oh no, that won't work for me. Or, you know, you go to a class or you watch something and you're like, ah, uh, that doesn't work in my market, right? All those things that we start telling ourselves or, you know, I'm not smart enough, I'm not good enough, I'm not whatever, right? We all have those, those stories. And so our beliefs will either move us forward or hold us back. And when they hold us back, it's really probably a lie that we're telling ourselves that we need to break through. So there's a process to removing your limiting beliefs so that you can see different results in your life. And it's a simple four-step process. I'm gonna give it to you right now. Um, so the first step is awareness. You have to know, you have to be aware of these thoughts. You have to know your thoughts are limiting you and holding you back, right? And um, it may sound pretty simple, but mo most of the time we can be a little um, asleep at the wheel on that. We might have some things that are so deep in our subconscious that we're not really paying attention to that inner dialogue that we're having. So we have to be aware, that's step one. And once you're aware of the thought, 
I want you to call like a timeout right then and there, like just literally say, okay, stop. And step two is to ask yourself, where is this coming from? Where is this, where is this thought coming from? Can I try to trace it back to something? Like, where is this showing up right, right now? Like what's triggering me? And part two of that could be, is this true? And I'm sure you're gonna find 99.9% .9 of the time it is not true, right? So now the third step is reframe, right? You have to reframe the thought. And so similar to a weed you might find out in your garden, if I go over to that weed and take a pair of scissors and just cut it at its stem, it'll be gone for a little bit. But what happens over time? Starts to grow back, right? So just like your thoughts, you have to remove this limiting thought, this negative thought from its roots. You have to yank it right out. And depending on how deep the roots are or how long you've been holding on to these thoughts, you might need the assistance of someone like me, a coach. I'm, I'm a certified coach in NLP and I'm a life coach. And so we can help you get into some of those deep thoughts, some of those past experiences that may be creating that environment and help you reframe it. Um, but it needs to be pulled out in a way and replaced with something different, right? So when I pull that weed out, I wanna plant something pretty in its place. So the last step would be, well, or part of that step would be you know, reframing the thought in a much more positive, empowering way. Probably not just to create an opposite statement, but to really get clear on something more truthful about yourself, to acknowledge something that you possess as, you know, a great strength or as a skill. Going back to what we talked about with strengths and weaknesses, another reason why having those assessments can be powerful, right? Because they tell you the things that you might not acknowledge about yourself. So it's, it's really putting that in its place, something that is much more truthful about you. And then the last step, so that it continues to grow, just like again, the flower in your garden is you've got to feed it. So you have to practice those new thoughts. Maybe it's affirmations uh, that you say to yourself every day. It's um, a vision board. You know, What are the things that you can put in front of you to really affirm that new thought and that new belief? So that it's the positive thought and belief that grows in its place. And as simple as it sounds, for some of us, like I said, you might need more help from a coach to work on this in a more, uh, more of a processed way. Um, yet again, you're so worth it, right? Because whatever we're, I think that for a lot of us, we spend so much time just holding ourselves back. We waste so much energy, and we may, we waste so much precious time. You know, we don't know. I, I. I spoke yesterday during Monday Morning Mojo on this concept of YOLO, right? You only live once. We don't know how much time we have. And so why would you want to spend whatever time you have here on, on putting yourself in a less than place, on limiting your own power, on limiting your own ability? You know, if you can, if you can see it, you can have it. It's just a matter of putting the process in place. So removing your limiting beliefs, it's like, I, I think it's like shedding extra weight. It's like like getting that anchor uh, and, and, and untying it off your ankle. And so this is a huge opportunity for you when it comes to living an extraordinary life and when it comes to achieving success at a high level. High achievers are not weighed down by their limiting thoughts. Now, they're human. They might have a thought, but they're, they're, they know how to quickly move through it and put themselves in a the mindset of what do I do next? What are my opportunities? What do I, uh, what great strengths do I possess? What opportunities are in front of me? And how do I achieve my goals? And how do I know that I can figure it out and I can do great things, right? So removing our limiting beliefs is super important. Any thoughts on that, ahas? Um, anyone had to work on that process themselves once or twice? Tell me in the chat or raise a hand. Can you relate to that? Yeah, I see some heads nodding, good. Awesome. All right, let's, let's wrap up with the last one. And then I'll have a few minutes for some ahas or Q and A. So please get ready with some final thoughts. I'd love to hear what this class, uh, you know, how it resonated with you. Step number six is to be accountable. 
So I, this is a powerful diagram because it talks about the difference between being accountable and being a victim. Nobody wants to be a victim yet. Is it true that a lot of times our life um, shows up and our thoughts now start to create this victim you know, mentality? And so um, I think when you are stuck in victim mode, you're not seeking out the reality. When you're stuck in victim mode, you are focused on excuses rather than results. When you're stuck in victim mode, you're blaming experiences, you're blaming people, you're blaming situations rather than taking responsibility and owning it, right? So if you're, if you're someone who is programmed to be accountable, then you are willing to look at a situation and assess what's going right and assess what's going wrong. You're willing to say, here's where I have some DNA on this. And here's what I can own. And here's where we can move forward, right? But if you're in a victim mindset, then you think that circumstances are in control and not you, right? That because of the market, fill in the blank. Because of my team leader, fill in the blank. Because of my experience, fill in the blank. Because of what that person is thinking, fill in the blank, whatever. And so it's really about understanding that we are shaping our reality every single day. Because we can be, you know, honestly, we could, you and I could be in the same room with the same experiences and the same events happening around us. And yet the way that I decide to respond to that event could be different than yours. And therefore we have two different outcomes, right? So we're shaping our reality. And so I think when you're a victim, you think that you are susceptible to circumstances and that life is happening to you. When you are in an accountable mindset, you believe that life is happening for you and that you get to decide how you take hold of life every day and shape your own reality. If you're accountable, you're solution oriented. If you're accountable, you are solution oriented. If you are in a victim mindset, you're making up a bunch of excuses. And you're starting sentences with, so that's not happening because, <laughs> or something like that, right? You're starting statements with uh, words like, um, it's, it's not possible because, right? And so, when you are accountable, you're much more open to looking at solutions and opportunities, and you're always focused on moving forward, moving forward, right? So it's always about an action plan. So someone who's accountable starts a sentence with, so I think the next step is, I think what we can do now is, what I'm going to say next will be, you know, it's always about moving forward, right? Not, not just staying stuck. And someone who is in a victim mindset is waiting and someone who's accountable is creating. Someone who's in a victim mindset is waiting and someone who is in an accountable mindset is creating, creating. So look, we can be on either side of the fence on any given day with any given conversation. Again, I, I recognize, right, we're human, however, this is about understanding and becoming more purposeful and intentional with how we want to show up and who we want to be in every conversation and in every you know, element of our, our business and our personal life. And where do you want to be? On, on what side of this fence do you want to be? Do you want to be a, a more accountable person or do you want to be defaulted into this victim mindset, right? And so again, the opportunity here starts with awareness because when you hear yourself using victim language, it's about being aware of that and say, okay, cancel, time out. I've got to shift and I have to start thinking and doing and speaking like someone who is more accountable to their actions. Does that make sense? So it's whether you're on the cause side of things or on the effect side of things. If you're a victim, you're stuck in cause. There's all these reasons it's because and all these things are happening and that's why. And if you are on the effect side of things, you wanna make change and you wanna be accountable to your actions 
and move forward. So I think accountability starts with a mindset and an attitude. And then there's an actual um, process to accountability. But before you can get into the process, which does require you being accountable to someone else, by the way, you cannot be accountable to yourself because we need someone else to, to call some things out for us, right? And so it, before you can get into the process of accountability, you have to get into the mindset of accountability. You have to be willing to be on the effect side of things and, and take responsibility. Um, what this diagram represents uh, very simply is that, you know, Mo Anderson uh, has some different accountability partners in her life. This is the example they use. And uh, so you can do the same exercise if you wanted to draw a circle and put your name in it and then draw out several arrows pointing to different aspects of your life. You can use this um, diagram related back to the wheel of life or the seven circles and Gary Keller's one thing. And ask yourself, who am I accountable in each area of my life, right? And a couple of things to take note. Number one, if you had an accountability partner in each area of your life, would you achieve more? And would you achieve at a higher level? The answer is yes. And then the second question to ask yourself is, who are those people going to be? And knowing that the person who makes a great accountability partner for you in your business is not necessarily gonna be your accountability partner for your spiritual goals, right? Or your financial goals. It's, it's acknowledging that you may have to have several people in your camp, right? And so this is another, I think, habit of highly effective, high achievers, high performers, is that they're not afraid of accountability and they have multiple coaches, they have multiple accountability partners. I have several coaches in my world that keep me accountable for different areas of my life. And so do you, this would be maybe an action for some of you to take from today's class. Um, and maybe this is the one thing that you start with, right? Is determining who's gonna be your accountability partner in each area of your life. So that's what this exercise is about. Who are the people in your box? Because without having that accountability partner, are you really determined to meet your goals in those key areas, as it says here, or are you just winging it, right? So this is about getting much more purposeful. Now, an accountability session is simple. It's also you know, pretty quick. It's a few questions. Number one is to look at what was the goal. What was the goal? That's the first thing. So if you're if you're going to hold someone else accountable, this this is what you're going to ask them, and these are the questions you would want your accountability partner to ask of you. So the first thing, of course, is what was the goal? Number two, how did you do? Right. So the the other thing that's important to acknowledge about your accountability partner, there has to be a strong level of trust. Because if you're not honest with your accountability partner, what is the point? You have to be honest with them. And so when they say, how did you do? You have to be honest. And then they'll probably ask you how you feel about it. Again, it's, it's being in, you know, real. And then based on that, what do you have to do next, right? So how do you keep moving forward or how do you get back on track? And this accountability conversation needs to be consistent. So probably weekly so that it's helping you really move forward. So those are the six personal perspectives. And I know we packed a lot of information in 90 minutes and um, we do have just a couple minutes left if anyone has any final thoughts, questions or ahas. And I really encourage you to share because it does help other people in the group too sometimes to hear what you're thinking or what your questions are. Um, and I trust that you got something valuable out of this. I trust that you found, you know, something that is going to help you move forward. And I would say before you go on to your next thing, if you can give yourself a couple of minutes to go through your notes and, and write down, like, what are you going to take action on? So I'm going to invite you to tell me right now, what is your aha? What are, you know, what was the most 
powerful part of this conversation for you. What will you do next? Any any thoughts on that? Deb, thank you. Sure. Um, I loved the the accountability box um, in really taking a moment to think about it in a number of areas in, in your life and, and who are those people. I really hadn't ever done that exercise until just now, you know, and I just actually just thinking about, I know who those people are in my life and, and actually to map it out and look at it and then realize that these are people that I have a strong level of trust with, um, but that maybe the conversations can get more specific as to how did I do, how did I feel about it, um, and what's next in those conversations, something I can weave in. So that, that was fantastic. Nice. Love that. Awesome. So give some thoughts to who those people will be. Who else has something to share before we go? Kathy Hartman, I see your face. You're going to kill me. Kathy, how are you? Tell me something you got out of today. Sorry, I have to unmute there. Okay. That's okay. I am, um, I'm going through some things and this was very interesting with a, just a personal item that I'm going through. Okay. So quite frankly, uh huh. Yeah, uh, business, yes, but just thinking about some personal things Absolutely. and how I'm going to um, move forward discussing <laughs> these personal issues that are not very nice and are not going to be pleasant. Um, but so this was just giving me like, oh my gosh, yep, that's what I need to do. Oh, wow, yep, that's that awesome. limiting belief. Oh yeah, that's what I need to do. So unfortunately, I wasn't thinking about real estate at this point well, i was that's just okay. thinking about this thing that i have to do look I, I, that's great and i think while there's a lot here we can apply to our business we we have to remember that our business grows to the extent that we do and so we have to stay focused on ourselves as a whole person you know like even as a coach i coach the whole person right so when when we have some things that we don't put enough time and attention to in our personal life, then we're out of, we're out of sync. So I think that it's really great that you see that this is applying in other areas of your life. And uh, I, it's, it looks and feels like you're, you're someone who's inspired to take some action on it too. So this showed up at the right time for you. It really did. I'm very happy. And I didn't that. expect it to. I yeah. didn't expect that. I expected to come in here and get some great things for business, which I did, but all of a sudden, everything was just clicking on this other level. Yeah, it was amazing. that's great. That's so really thank you. Powerful. You're welcome. Now, my pleasure. And again, you know, if I can help anybody, um, you know, process some of this or break it down, feel free to reach out. But um, I think, again, the key is take some time right now and just figure out like, what was the most important part of this conversation for you? Because even though these are, are six perspectives to apply in your life and you really, you know, we all should apply them all to our lives, we can't take it all on at one time. So what is the one perspective that needs attention right away? Because again, it, it creates that domino effect that makes everything else seem easier, right? Or less important. So, you know, identify what perspective needs more of your attention right now and, and make a plan around that. So I thank you all for joining me today. Uh, it was really great. I, again, this is one of my favorite courses to teach because you can see like from some of your reactions, um, really how profound it is in, in your life and, uh, and how that is going to impact your business. So thank you for joining me. And, um, you know, I appreciate all your feedback. And if, again, if I can help with anything, let me know. My email is anagibbs at kw.com. And this was the six personal perspectives. So have a great day, everybody. Thank Thanks, you. Anna. Bye-bye.